And now, weighing in out of the blue corner, Josh the Pong Thompson. 100% agree. And on the other mic, he weighs in from the red corner, Big John McCarthy. Well, now we are lucky enough to have a man that, you know what, from 1999 is when I first saw him fighting. He was a guy that was absolutely skilled as far as his athleticism but he went on the ultimate fighter and this is the man that made dana white famous this is the guy that was running everything dana did a speech about do you want to be a fucking fighter and it's because of bobby southworth bobby southworth how you doing brother i'm doing well thank you for the uh amazing intro how y'all doing, oh, you, dude, doing good? you you deserve it man you know you you don't get the credit for what was happening on that show and how things went you did a fantastic job there. You did the first fight of the, the show. I remember that because it was right. against Loden Sincade. I refereed that sucker and everything, but you were a huge impact on everybody within that show, and I don't think people realize how impactful you were. Well, I appreciate that. It's always good to get a little love, right? You ain't getting none of that <laughs> from get, me today, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, have and, I ever? And, have I ever? And here comes oh, the friend, right? All I've ever done was give you love, my man. Shit, I, I just like to do it when you're not around. I got you. Uh, I got you. No, but uh, like right now, I mean, people could say that fighters need you right now more than ever to basically oh. pump it up because you're the reason why these guys get paid on the Ultimate Fighter now. Yeah. Correct? That is, that, that, you know... No, just say it. Yes, yes, that's that correct. Is, that's correct. That is correct. <laughs> yeah. That is correct. I was there. That is correct. <laughs> I mean, that's what Kenny was even talking about. If you guys haven't seen the Kenny Florian uh, show we did with him about a week and a half ago, check that one out. But he's giving you a lot of love. And I actually came to bat with you uh, for him, for you as well with him. And we were talking about all the influence you had at American Kickboxing Academy when I first came in, uh, all the influence you had on the Ultimate Fighter, and just, you know, throughout the your career and the influence you brought to a lot of the guys that came out of AK, you know, and just being part of the jiu-jitsu journey for them as well as just putting the things together. You were one of those guys that, man, you didn't kick a whole lot, but you had kicking, but your boxing was it was on par. You know, it was fucking right up there with some of the best guys. I mean, you, you were able to spar with some professional boxers out of AK that was there. Uh, Cecil was there. Oh some other God. good guys that were out of there. Yes, yeah, Cecil the liver, was so good. The liver killer. Yeah, the liver killer. So... You know, and then, uh, you know, you had all these good guys there for boxing and then your jiu-jitsu, you know, right up there on top, man. You train with a lot of top guys out of there and then you had your program out of AKA. But I guess right now, fighters need someone like you, a voice like you right now. If there's ever going to be a fighter's union, you know what I mean? Let's go ahead and run through what happened at the Ultimate Fighter, though. How did that all come about when you guys were having this conversation? Wait, I'm here to get paid. I'm, I, I want to get paid to fight. You know, how did that all come about? Well, you know, when we signed... The, for the show, and I can I can go dig the I tell everybody this I can get I can dig the contract out of my garage somewhere. We weren't supposed to fight. It was supposed to be like some type of road rule world road rules real world challenge where whoever made it to the finals was going to fight in the finale. And then basically, I mean, this is my perspective. We were winning all the challenges, right? We were crushing Team Couture, and they were their guys were getting knocked off one by one. So that they decided, I think, to like. Let's let's try to fight because I think they thought they had the better fighters on their team. And I don't think that was true. Um, Because even at that time, I think, (laughs) no, Stefan was on Team Couture. But um, then they were like, you guys have to fight. And we were like, Loden was kind of a big part of that, too. You know, God, you know, God rest his soul. But um, it was like we talked about nobody say anything. So we organized, I guess it's called a whiteout where nobody was going to talk. And so the producers got all pissed and ran over to Dana. And so that what John was saying, that's where all of that stuff started. He called us over there and he was like, do you want to be a fucking fighter? All the, all the things that he was saying. And um, I'm thinking in my head, I'm like, you know, we're all, we're all fighters. I mean, nobody, I did, nobody, did it, nobody <laughs> didn't want to fight, but we just, it was like, nobody, I, I was like, I want to get paid to fight. And he was like, well, you're going to get, you're winning a hundred thousand dollars on this show. And I'm like, no, we're getting a chance to fight three times. And if we win three fights, then you make, you'd make a hundred thousand dollars. That's like asking the person who goes on the survivor Island and wins to do three more islands and then get their million. You know what I mean? It's just not like, it's not the same thing. And like John was saying, and I'll say it right now, it's like a lot of people, it is true. They don't know 
some of the outcomes of that fight. Literally, that's where performance of the night bonuses came from. Performance of the night bonus for it was called fight. It was called. It wasn't called performance bonuses back then. It was called something mm -hmm. a fight of the night, um, knockout of the night, um, submission, the submission of the night, and then the two fighters who had the best fight would get the performance of the night. But um, mm -hmm. so they offered us if you win submission or knockout. If it doesn't go to the judges' decisions, you get five Gs, right? And so yeah. while we were on the show, thirty-seven and a half came on, right? And then I I finished loading. Diego finished his first two fights. And I guess Dan, they were like, Hey man, this does something by UFC. I think it was 40. They started having those $25,000 bonuses. You know what I mean? And so now it's up to $50,000. So mm. that's, that's my take on that. And I want every fighter, including you, cause didn't you get some performance bonuses to back pay me with interest of percentage of all, of all the fucking money. Right. There you go. <laughs> Now we're talking. Where's my? That, I, don't the, exactly I don't need the. I don't need the fighter Bobby. union. I don't need the fighters union money if I get that money with interest, right? Bobby wants his one percent, right? Your one percent plus interest. <laughs> point zero, point zero, zero, point zero, zero one. Doesn't just want the just want that. He wants the interest too. Of course, I'm he's sorry. waited a long time. It's been a while. Well, it's been years. Oh, jeez. Uh, I mean, it's look. You have come. When I first came in, you know, to AKA, I know that you and I kind of butted heads a little bit here and there wasn't a lot though. It was like you were the no. bigger guy, but it was kind of, you had such a, you had a good long standing relationship with Javier, you know, and how did that relationship develop for you to get into it, to be an AKA? Cause I know Frank Shamrock was there. Uh, Brian Johnson was there. Uh, BJ Penn had come like kind of right, right I brought, after I had got there. I brought there. BJ. I oh, brought you brought BJ. BJ. See, I, I didn't know BJ. that. Yeah. I didn't know that. So go ahead and tell him. me the, the BJ. Um, I used to teach BJ at Half Gracie's, you know, I mean, the Mountain View School was the first one that Half yep. opened up. And I was like, I was the guy teaching all the classes. I actually was teaching Dave in the beginning when Dave first mm. showed up there. Dave Camarillo. A, Dave Camarillo. Yeah, he was a white belt. And him and his brother were both white belts. Not that they weren't extremely talented guys, just mm. like BJ. And I'll say a lot of things about guy. what we're talking. I'll talk about guys. I'm not taking any credit for the, you know, the path that their careers took because those guys were going to do something regardless. I was just along for the ride, you know, maybe like you said, maybe I had some influence and maybe some help, but a lot of those guys are already destined for greatness. So I can't really take credit. But anyways, our how Gracie's gym was we were I mean, we were one of the we were probably the top gym in Northern California. You know, we had a lot of really good jujitsu guys there. A lot of a lot of dudes came out of the, it was Half and Caesar together at first. So mm -hmm. like the Diaz brothers, um, Dave Terrell, a lot of people forget about how talented a fighter that guy was. There's Jake Shields, Gilbert Melendez. I mean, the list kind of like AKA. The list goes on of guys. Wasn't there brought, a guy named Cameron? Wasn't Cameron out of there? I, you know, infamous a little bit. There was a whole legal thing that went on with Cameron. Yeah. Um, he was an extremely talented grappler. I think he actually submitted Marcelo Garcia back in the mm. day. Um, and then you know, BJ walked into that gym and um, was doing. I mean, it wasn't like. He was tapping some of the white belts. He wasn't tapping any of the better guys, but he was doing enough to make an impact. You know what I mean? And then mm -hmm. it just went from there. You know, he was there. He got his blue belt, eventually moved on to Nova Union and did all the great things that he did. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. How did he yeah. make his way back into AKA? How did he make his way into AKA there? Oh. So I was at AKA and um, and I'll go, we'll, we'll backtrack to okay. me and Javier's relationship. But um, I was there and me and him and all, we'd had a, relationship even after i left half gracie's half and i had a falling out um one of my friends suggested that hey his name his name was rich he said suggested there's this gym called aka it happened to be like two and a half miles down camden road from where from my house and so he mm -hmm. took me in there um and i rolled with there was a submission fighting team there run by brian johnston yeah. i rolled with all the guys i you know not bragging but i i tapped everybody there i tapped brian a couple times and Brian and I hit it off, I guess, because like most people would like try to crank submissions and I didn't wasn't hurting anybody. I wasn't being a dick about it. And he is the one who got me in with Javier. He was like, hey, Hav, man, this guy came in. He crushed. Every I mean, I don't know exactly what he said, but he crushed everybody. And then he was helping these guys, like showing them moves and teaching them. He's a good dude. And so that carried a lot of weight with Javier because Brian didn't like a lot of people. 
You know what yeah. I mean? It was just not like he was a jerk, but I mean, no, martial arts, not a jerk. martial arts wise. And, you know, you know, you've been there, the guys that yeah. come into the gym, they think they're the next big thing. They get tapped mm-hmm. out by a 120 pound girl and then you don't see him again. You know what I mean? It's yeah. just, he's, he's the, he's the reason he's the one who, who started my, my relationship with Javier. And then that started me doing golden gloves, boxing, got me into MMA and BJ was watching me fight. You know, J- Big John probably remembers this. You may not, but the IFC, the IFC was a promotion that springboarded a tremendous number of fighters into the UFC. Paul Smith. Vladdy, Chubb, yeah. John Marr. Yeah. I mean, there's Nathan Marquardt, Gil Castillo, another super talented fighter I forgot yeah. to mention from the Gracie Systems gym back then. Um, I haven't heard that name in forever, Gil Castillo. Right? Nobody remembers that dude. Dude fought yeah. for he the title good. in like – two different weight classes. You know what I mean? And so he was really good. Mm -hmm. Um, And that was what I had some success in the IFC. And so BJ had just won worlds, right? First American to win worlds at black belt. And him and his brothers were asking me, Hey, it's time to to move into MMA. And I was like, dude, you have to come to this gym. I'm like this, this guy's here. This guy's here. Javier is a great coach. They were very apprehensive because of Frank. Which, yeah. again, that was one of the reasons that you and I had friction in the beginning, not because of us, but because it was Shamrock versus, remember how you used to always say Jiu yeah. Jitsu? So there was yeah. that Shamrock Gracie <laughs> rivalry thing going on. And so there was always that little bit of standoffishness between, because my Jiu Jitsu program, remember in the evening, it was right yeah. before, and then it you guys right would come us. in. Yeah. So, you know, I, I spoke well of Javier in the gym to BJ. He came over, he checked out what we were doing. Javier invited him back. He came back, sparred a couple of the guys like Mark Buddy, you know, who yeah. was a pretty more of a street. He was a good kickboxer, but I think he preferred to fight in the street. But, um, you know, BJ kind of so socked weird. him up and Javier saw that. And you, I mean, you could obviously see the talent that he had from just, I mean, we all see the, 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 the YouTube clips of the Hawaiian street fights. It's almost like yeah. watching low level, you know, no. like, uh, better than Cam- Kama MMA fights, you know what I mean? The, the street fighters there, they're somewhere between pro and amateur level they MMA. Scrap, yeah. They scrap it yeah. out, and they're takedowns, ground and pound, looking for subs. So it's like, you know, he it's just true. he had it. It's something that's in their blood. So yeah. If you're looking to do MMA bets, there is no one better than Bet US. I'm telling you right now, they are fantastic. The odds are great. And right now, if you use our promo code of YouTube 150, you will get 150% on top of what you put in up to $2,000. And if you do it and you add more money later on, it's 125%. So they even add on top of it. Bet US is the very best when it comes to MMA gambling. If you want to make a bet on a fight, you know a fighter is going to win. I'm telling you right now, go to Bet US, use that code YouTube 150. And you'll get that 150% on top of what you put down. You can also use them for NFL, NBA, any of the sports that are available on BetUS. YouTube 150 is your promo code. 150% bonus on your first deposit. 125% bonus on your next two deposits. Don't miss out. Go to BetUS. It's crazy. Because people forget that, like, don't forget, but I'm saying, like, I think that they believe that somebody can just come in off the street and have that ability to box and that the, the fearlessness to go ahead and take a shot, to give a shot. And BJ just had that. I think from growing up in Hawaii, yeah. you know, his brother JD was probably the best one out of the three of them. Yes. JD would have probably been a UFC JD champion. BJ was a, you know, but JD was probably the best athlete and the best, I think just that killer instinct. He just, he had some he was- issues with his, he had the nerve issue in his arm, in his neck that went down into his arm and his arm started to atrophy. He had to quit rolling, had to quit training. And I, I don't, probably would have ended up being a UFC champion. And it wasn't his thing. You know, BJ, no, Re- Reagan, well, they were all extremely gifted, right? Yeah. But BJ was the one who wanted to be a fighter. You know what I mean? He was the one. He wasn't like, I want to try MMA or, you know, it wasn't like a bucket list thing for him. He was like, I want to. He was like pre Conor McGregor, right? The, but without all yeah. the hype and all the, the hugeness of the sport, he wanted to conquer the world. And he, you know, he did yeah. it. He did it in jujitsu and he did it in MMA. So JD was phenomenally talented. I wanted to see him and Reagan both fight. Yeah. Um, Reagan made, Reagan did. Reagan yeah, did. Reagan he made did. some forays, yeah. but again, Elite XC. It, that wasn't their thing. No. And 
they didn't really need to do it either. So it was like yeah, BJ was that's, that's BJ, true. Uh, B, BJ that's was true. a rarity. You know, it's like there's not a lot of people that are going to sit on on. I mean, look at again another Conor McGregor reference. Are we ever going to see that guy fight again? He's going to sit on his money. He doesn't really need to fight. So that's yeah. one of the reasons BJ was a rarity. He was just a born fighter. You know what I mean? It didn't matter if he had no money or ten million bucks. He wanted to scrap. How was your? And then how did your relationship with Javier get outside of the Brian introduction? But then how did that grow into more? Um, I mean, I, I had not to pat myself on the back. I had some talent. You know, basically mm -hmm. when I first came in, you remember Travis and Danny Kelly. I didn't oh, have yeah. any, I didn't have any formal training either, but I told Hob, this is why I'm here. I want to be a fighter. And he told me, look, you're, I watched you roll. Your grappling is great. We, we got to see your stand up skills. And so he put me in the, the, for the first couple of weeks I was there, I ended up sparring Travis a few times, Danny Kelly, a few times, you know, and I'm not going to say I did well, but like all those guys we talked about, I didn't quit. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I knew that I was going to have to pay my dues. I was going to have to take my lumps when I was doing pretty good for somebody who had no formal training. And I think Hobbs saw that I had some, some drive and some talent. He only trained me. I think I came there like in January of 90, 98. Mm -hmm. And he trained me for a couple months and I went to Northern California golden gloves and got a silver medal more. I think I got robbed because <laughs> I was unaffiliated. They, there's a big thing about our gym wasn't inside the USA boxing thing. And there's a bunch of politics yeah. with that. A lot of people thought I won the fight. Um, and it just went from there. And he didn't, I mean, honestly, I, I'm probably the, after Brian, I'm probably the first homegrown fighter, like the guy to come to Javier with nothing, you know, yeah. just jujitsu. I wasn't a college <laughs> wrestler. I didn't have fights under my belt, you know, and, he, he brought me up, you know, I got to give him, we butted heads, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, along the way we had some head butts and things like that and me getting expelled from the gym, but overall, I mean, it couldn't have been that bad. You own an AKA now out of San Antonio, yeah, so, <laughs> the head butts couldn't have been that bad, <laughs> you know, I mean, but you know, we won two, no. two world titles and in, in strike force. And I got, I fought and I'm not going to say I was the greatest fighter at all, but of all, you know, but I, I had some success in MMA, yeah. like greater than I ever thought, you know, I just, I was kind of like that guy that I tried jujitsu and I had some ability. They said, well, do you ever think about competing? So I did some tournaments and won. Then it was like, well, do you ever think about fighting? And so, and I just was always willing to take that next step. And I was just a hobbyist. I'm like, you were talking about the guys, who was that guy from the, what was that guy? The MMA the British guru. commentator, the, the MMA <laughs> guru, that was me. I was just a guy that was on the under, on the underground forum, like being a fanboy and watching <laughs> UFCs. And underground I, forum. Remember yeah. that? See, old just school. Oh, yeah, trip, right? He's just on there talking trash. It's, 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 I could do him. Yeah. And so I Bobby, just, what, what was it that got you into jujitsu? What made you go to Half Gracie's in the beginning? Um, So I had a friend, this kid, his name was Conti Leung. He was a, he was a Chinese immigrant. Right. Mm -hmm. He moved to Santa Cruz with his family um, and I would always see him. He lived near me. And sometimes when I would be riding my bike through the neighborhood to play basketball, I'd go by his house. But you could see in the back, he would be back there like he knew Kung Fu. So he would be back there like throwing kicks and stuff like that. And I always wanted to be a martial artist, but my parents were pacifists. Like it was my brothers and sisters. I'm adopted, but my brothers and sisters had to like beg my parents to let me play competitive athletics Cause I was always out in the back, like throwing balls over the clothesline and stuff like that. And it turns out like maybe six years ago, we actually found out through like ancestry.com. Apparently my biological father, he played three years of professional football in the NFL. Mm. No so shit. yeah, we never knew that. So I was, I was, um, you were destined is what you're saying. I don't, I mean, I was to be an <laughs> no, athlete. Hey, I mean, I was to be an you athlete. Had, you had a, exactly. And so, so, I was always driving to play basketball. I was a college basketball player. I would see Conti. I wanted to do martial arts, and he would give me these tips. Oh, this is how you throw the kicks. And I'm like, yeah, but even to this day, I'm still not that flexible. But he would say, you have to do this 50 times, 100 times, and get it down. And so I would try. But I was focused on other things, you know, basketball and surfing. But eventually, he was going down. This is years after high school. He was going down to Torrance, and he was taking privates at the Gracie School. And so mm. I was driving by the cliffs, checking out the surf. 
and this dude was a hustler, man. He he had already, I was probably 24. He was a, li- a year or two younger than me. He had already bought this house. He was already opening a second restaurant. You know what I mean? He was just, he was always grinding. And he, st- I hear this Bobby, because I'm going 50 miles an hour. I stop. There's Conti. I turn around. I park in the driveway where he's renovating the bottom of this house. He's like, dude, have you ever, have you, have you seen the ultimate fighting championship? And I was like, what the fuck is that? You know what I mean? I was, I'd never heard of it. I was dealing poker. I was commuting back and forth up to Oakland, back to Santa Cruz for the weekends to spend time with my daughter. Um, And he brought me in and he had the first two UFCs on tape. And so we sat there and he's like, you know, like every, who's going to win? Oh, the karate guy, because of all the movies that I see. You know what I mean? And choked out, tapped out, you know, Hoist beats everybody. He's all, dude, I've been going down to train at that gym and take privates. He's all, I'm bringing this this Brazilian dude up to start the school. Cause like I said, he was a hustler. He already, he had this real estate thing. He had his restaurants. And so I went there to take my first jujitsu classes from this purple belt. And this John might even remember this guy. Do you remember Jararaca? Yes. Marco Albuquerque. Yeah. He was, he, that was him. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? So it's like, that he know because you were in the LA Jiu Jitsu community way back in the day, and so this is some yep. dude he was with. He came from, I think he belted up on the plane, so to speak, but he came from Brazil, yep. <laughs> and then yep. he ended up going back to Carlson Gracie's and working his way back up. But he was like, he a, was with Marco Huas. He was with all. He all got, these I watched. Guys. I watched. I watched Marco Huas beat his ass in a hotel room. <laughs> 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 yeah, he he made a lot of people uh, angry. So oh yeah. Um, it's funny up, how so many guys get belted up on an airplane ride somewhere, correct? Right? Yeah, exactly. He actually ended up, there was a thing going back to the underground. He 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 got killed in one of the favelas mm. or something, like took a cab and the cab was a crim. It was like the guy took him into the favelas and they killed him and some other guy, unfortunately. Yeah. But he was the first guy. And mm. so I was up in Oakland, which is like 75 miles away from my hometown of Santa Cruz. And I was actually working till 5.30 in the morning. And so I'd get off and I would drive down to Santa Cruz the first week to take these classes with Marco. And um, I threw up a triangle on Conti and he spazzed out and he tried to do that run over your head, the dick yeah. triangle defense one. And I popped two ribs. And so I was yeah. like bad, like I was out for months. But during that time, I still was driving down and watching, trying to, because I, I took my first class, dude, and I was fucking hooked. It was like, mm. It was probably worse than if somebody had given me a hot shot. You know what I'm saying? I was fucking hooked on jujitsu. It was crazy. That was exactly the same as me. That was it. First that, time I, I rolled with hoist, and it was like, how the fuck do you do that? I, I got to know. Yeah. And, it was just, and most people, most people, they quit. Most people, that yeah. breaks them mentally. Like I was talking about the 120-pound women. I've had police officers come to my gyms and get tapped out by women and not come back. And it's like, how... How, How are you not? Are you not that would come make you, back? That would make you say, I have to come back. Because I was getting crushed at when. So anyways, I got hurt. And during that time, Caesar Gracie came down to Santa Cruz and did a seminar. And I went with Marco to watch it. And I found out that Caesar's gym in um, Walnut Creek was only 25 minutes away from where I was working. And so instead of mm-hmm. driving an hour and a half, I could drive 25 minutes. And that's what really started the ball rolling is I went to Caesar's and, um, he put me to roll with some of his white belts first. One of them crushed me, but he, they called him Ephraim. His name was Ephraim, but they called him Ephraim. He was like 350 pounds, and he was almost a blue belt, and he crushed me. But all the other ones I was doing good with. But he had a couple little blue belts that tapped me out, and that even hooked me even more because I was like, the same thing. These guys are small. They're unathletic. When I have the knowledge that they have, I think that you know I can be really effective with this, and that's just hooked me to jujitsu. And that's what really started started everything. And I was with Caesar, just Caesar for the first year and a half, two years. Um, and I mean, I was making good money, but he gave me a deal where I would show up and be the Yuki for the private lessons before and after class in the morning and in the evening. And so mm-hmm. I would get off work. I would drive there. Privates would start like at 7 or 7.30 in the morning. And it would be me and Kurt Osiander. We were the Yukis mm-hmm. for the private. And so Caesar had this system. 7.05, someone would come in for their half an hour, right? 7.15, somebody would come in for the next one. So it was a racket. So he would, it would be Kurt with one guy, me with the other guy, and he'd spend a little time because they were overlapping, and then he would move on to the next guy. And when he would leave, he would leave us there to, like, help the guys with the moves. 
And during that time with Marco, I had learned all the basics, like the, and I, and I was obsessed, right? So like the bridge and roll, pass the guard, side control mount, el knee elbow escape, close guard, hip bump sweep, scissor sweep, Kimura arm. I had like a lot of the basic stuff down even after the first week, cause I was going to two classes in the morning. So I was training mm -hmm. four hours of jujitsu a day from at my first class. So with Caesar, I had all these guys were coming in for privates and all we were showing them was Upa, the triangle pass member. Oh, put your arm yeah. in and let me tap you. The, the <laughs> first pass they would teach to everybody. Let me, let me break, let me, let me break your guard by sliding my arm into the leg so you can triangle me. Yes. Yeah. So I could help these guys for like the first three to four months. And that's how I got into teaching. You know what I mean? I never got in. I never wanted to be a fighter, but helping with the privates and seeing how jujitsu was empowering these, you know, these, they, they were like computer nerds, business professionals, people that really had never done some athletic, in Silicon Valley, especially, well, this was in one, but you know, in that area, in the Bay yeah, area, that's, you get a Bay lot area. of those people, biotech, medical. And so it was very empowering. Well, during that, that era, it was the dot com, dot com right? During yeah. that era, dot, it was the dot com. That, that's basically just what the tech industry is now. It's just all dot com people. Yeah. Well, I'm telling you right now, when I am outside working and it is blazing hot, the thing that has saved my life this summer is Element. I love Element as a product. We're talking about a product that puts electrolytes, magnesium, and salt back in your system so you can function at your very best. When we're talking about salt, a lot of people think it's not good for you. Well, that has been proven wrong. It is absolutely something you need. And the best part about Element is they use salt in a way that it actually tastes good. Stay salty, my friend, is a great line. And it's the absolute truth when it comes to Element as a drink. John uses Element out there on the farms. I give it to my kids when they're out there playing sports. Like my son, he's super active in lacrosse as well as soccer. It's good to give it to the kids, keep their bodies hydrated, keep their muscles hydrated. The sodium is good for them, especially in this hot weather here in Texas, as well as for you out there in Tennessee. But hey, if you guys have athletes in your family, make sure you keep them hydrated by using Element. Use our description down below. Use the link, sorry, in the descriptions down below. Yeah. Make sure you hit that link. And every purchase you guys make through our link, they'll send you a bonus product. Of That's a what's bonus so important, man. You got to use that link because you'll get extra product. It's free. You're getting freebies. Exactly. So make sure you guys use our link down below in the descriptions for that bonus package of product every purchase you guys make. Yeah. And so I, I decided, you know what, man, and you know what, I, I was watching Caesar live the jujitsu life and I'm all this, I want to do this. I want to be a teacher. I want to have an academy. And so Half came and he was there. For, I, I don't remember all the timelines, but I got my blue belt from Half, <clears throat> And then he was like, look, I'm going to open a school in Mountain View. And so Mountain View was like 40 minutes from my hometown of Santa Cruz. So I could go with Half to Mountain View and still make the commute and see spend more time with my daughter and stuff like that. And so that was how I made that move. And it was then that I decided to start thinking about fighting. That was when they were like, mm -hmm. you won these tournaments. Do you think about fighting? But then me and Half had a falling out. Right. And so mm -hmm. I knew then that I had to be a fighter if I wanted to teach jujitsu because I was only a blue belt. Right. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have, I wasn't Brazilian. I, my last name wasn't Gracie. So I was going to have to fight to show people that I had credentials and something legitimate to teach them. So that's how that all started with, that's how I wound up at American Kickboxing Academy. And um, basically I founded the jujitsu program there. Javier didn't even have a jujitsu program and I ran it for five years. It was pretty, we had, it was pretty successful. We had, I don't know, 70, 75 students in there. Yeah. And when Javier, Javier and I had the headbutt, the falling out, that's when Dave kind of came in. And that's really what he came in, took over my program and a lot of like my, I think my top seven students all got their black belts from him. Steve, yeah. soccer. Um, There's so many dudes like within the next three or four years. And so, yeah. you know, yeah. going back to what you guys were talking about, the influence in with Ultimate Fighter and MMA in general. And then at AKA, it's, you know, yeah, I've, I've, I've been I've been blessed to be a part of some of that history. And I don't really need the credit. I mean, I know what I did. And it's just mm -hmm. nice to see that, you know, our team is. In my opinion, AKA is the top team still in MMA. I don't think there's another team that has won more titles than we have. Maybe Militic has won as many, but not <clears throat> holding almost all the belts. I mean, at one time, AKA held every belt except, I think, welterweight, right? If mm -hmm. Fitch had to beat GSP, they would have had heavyweight, light heavyweight when DC held both belts, right? 
Mm-hmm. Well, that was different, a little bit different of eras, but they would have at one time held every single belt the UFC had to offer. Yeah, because they had Rockhold at 85, they had DC 205, and, they had Kane and, and heavy, heavyweight. And Kane at heavyweight, and then it was DC yeah. at, 20, at 205 and 225, mm-hmm. or at, and at heavyweight, but then also Khabib at 55. Yeah. So it was a, yeah. it was a lot of belts. And then you it always was. had that belt too, right? You had that fight with Eves, and that would have been – yeah, I, I do the Should same have been. thing. Yeah, there I mean, goes that fight again. It's always like that. It's yeah. like you're always, <laughs> yeah. for at least for me. I mean, I, you had some some be- greater success than I did. I was always that one fight away from the money fight, right? Where yeah. you would have been able to stack some cash and maybe start to do some things. And it was then, a little bit more of a generational thing, though, because you were a little bit older. You were, yeah. you know, and it's funny that I'm we were all now, this. man. Yeah, yeah, so you know what I mean. Congratulations, and, you made it. See, that's good. <laughs> and I wish I was fifty-five, Bobby. <laughs> I thought I was older than you. Oh no. hell! No. <laughs> <laughs> but it's um, it is it, it is that you that generation where you were kind of if you were forty, I was still like twenty-seven, twenty-eight, somewhere in there. Yeah, you know. And yeah. I just remember, I remember this like it was yesterday because. Fitch and I had this conversation um, when he started kind of doing some training or teaching after he kind of re- was getting closer to retirement and he was getting, it was like kind of his last couple fights and you used to get mad at us at training. Cause we would like try and jump past your guard and we try and do things, you know, and you're like, dude, like we're here to grapple. We're not here for fucking aerobics class. Like, what are you doing? Like this <laughs> dude, like do jujitsu. You used to get so mad. Like I'm going to get hurt. You guys trying to train like this. And we, you know, Fitch and I used to talk after practice. Like, man, fucking Bobby, man, what a pussy, what a pussy. <laughs> and then, but then, but then, when we got thirty seven, thirty eight years old, and we had to train with those young guys, and oh, they're trying yeah. to jump past our guard, and they're the, trying to guillotine you. The Dagestanis, and they were the Dagestani guys going fucking crazy, Bro, right? They're trying to take your neck home and shit. You're like, what the fuck? I'm like these guys, and Fitch and I would look at each other like. Fuck, Bobby was right all the time. Bobby was right. <laughs> but, you know, and to your, I was being a pussy, but you guys also came from a wrestling background, right? And I never, mm. I mean, jiu-jitsu was the first martial art I ever trained, right? I was just a basketball player and a surfer. And I think Big John has talk, touched on this so much, like the training of wrestling. I mean, every day, it's like you're going, it's the Olympic finals, you know, when you're yeah. at every wrestling practice, everything you do in there. And so I think you guys are used to that. And that's one of the reasons that physically, mentally, I mean, you develop that body, that that will, that focus, and you're just ready that to, to grind and go hard. And jujitsu at one at that time, the more old school, it was a totally different approach. You know, yeah. I think you see a change in that a little bit with the rise of submission grappling. I mean, when you go no gi, it's gonna become more physical just by the nature of it, you know, and and that's a good thing. I think it's forcing jujitsu to adapt, you know, but you cannot train like that every day. And you, I mean, I still train three, four days a week with my guys. Um, and I don't yell at them like I do to you. I just crush them when they start trying to go too hard, you know? So uh, it's just, but I don't want, I don't want to train like that, but it definitely it's, has its benefits for sure. It has its benefits in short, you know, if you do it, like but you said, three days a week, you've got to break it down. You know, like I'll go hard, you know, I'll go hard twice a week. If, you know, if I'm on the mats twice a week, I'll go hard twice a week. But then the other days I'll just roll with the small guys yep. and just let, you know, and let them kind of bounce around and just kind of control them. And, and that's about it. You're not trying to go hard every single day, especially now at this age, Yeah, you know, but it's, it was just that moment though, her <laughs> Fitch and I, we literally at the end of our careers were like, Fuck man, Bobby was right. <laughs> These guys, because they, they don't have we didn't we didn't have a chill back then. There was no chill zone. It was like, yeah. like hey man, calm down. I'm 40. I'm I got to get to my fight. You this guys is, are still 27. This is what it's like to be old. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so you feel it though. You know the like constant grind. Get off me. Like you're trying to do scissor takedowns. Like hey, you're gonna fucking roll up on my ankle. You're gonna hurt me if you keep doing that stuff. Yeah. I'm not gonna train with you anymore. But uh, but I also wanted to toot your horn a little bit, man. You you um. Like when I first came in and I was working with Frank and then I was also BJ kind of came in. He he was a big reason why I started taking your class more often was because BJ came in. You guys kept bragging me. BJ's this good. BJ's good. You know, he was able to, you know, mounted Frank. Frank couldn't get out like during the noon training. Yeah. I literally quit my job and just came in and started training during the day because BJ came to class one night and mopped the floor with me. And I, and everyone was kind of, I think you, I believe you were there with Javier. I know Bob and Javier were both there, but I believe you were there too. Cause it was right. It was kind of in between 
We everyone started. wanted to see you everyone get your to ass see handed to you because you had a big mouth. <laughs> <laughs> but I wanted, but it was that That's moment that I was like, chin. man, he's always doing yeah. this. Just kept yeah. going. That jaw's been working that whole time, man. <laughs> Don't be jealous, guys. Don't be jealous. Um, but yeah, that moment was kind of a, a, a lesson like, hey, man, I actually got to get more involved in, in jujitsu itself, not just Frank Shamrock's submission grappling. Yeah. And I started training with you uh, more often. You know, when we, after we would do your class, then we'd go in the back, we'd do the bike workouts. Yep. It all kind of started meshing together. And we all got better at that time. So, and you were my coach at the time. It was like, you were always bagging on me, but you were always, you know, also giving me a lot of advice. At fighter training is where, where Bobby and I kind of, we meshed really well. Yeah. Jiu-jitsu at night was kind of the, it's like, hey, I'm your coach. I'm not your friend anymore kind of thing and mentality. But I, it, it worked out. It actually worked a lot. Well, in the beginning, too, that's really where the AKA, the fight training came from. Because in the beginning, we, BJ and the jiu-jitsu guys, right, we were all training at noon because mm -hmm. the Frank Shamrock guys were at night. And it was after that where we were like, hey, man, let's try to mesh this thing up. And that's where you and Crazy, well, Crazy Bob was already involved, but you started coming, Liquid Rob started, you know, some of the guys that were part of Shamrock's team started coming in. And I think really that's kind of what helped, you know. Was, yeah, you're, you're Dave Velasquez, Kelly Delante, like they all started kind of, they were kind of yeah. already there because they didn't have real jobs, you know. Yeah. Um, so they were kind of there hanging out and training a little bit, but they kept telling me, oh, he's so good, he's this, he's that. Yeah. So then I started, I was like, you know what, I got to quit, man. If I'm going to try and fight, I got to quit, so. BJ That's was, I mean, started. he was a phenomenal talent, you know, was, there's no denying it. He, I mean, my evolution, he was mopping though. the floor with me. Well, I mean, <laughs> so, was, and he's a 55 or so, you know, but a lot of my evolution though came like, because I was, I started taking your jiu-jitsu class and you spent the time knowing that I, I started going to the noon training. You spent the time to work with me and train me and, and, and help me with my actual real jiu-jitsu versus just the submission grappling by Frank. Yeah. And it made a big difference in my career. So I owe you that, man. Boy, I owe you I, a lot. I thank you. Know? you. I appreciate that. I'm yeah. glad I could have helped in some small way, man. Yep. You know? I mean, yeah, it was you and then, you know, and then you had the falling out and then Dave came in, but then the growth there, but then you came back, you know, that little, you know, there too. And so that having everyone there together was, it felt good. There was a, there was a, I try was, to tell everybody like, when I moved to Texas, I still wanted to fight a couple a couple more times. I mean, I was already 40, but I still wanted to fight. So Pete Spratt has a gym here where he had with, with another guy named Rodrigo Pinheiro. But most of the time, they're doing BJJ or they're doing kickboxing. They weren't really doing MMA. There was a couple boxing gyms here, but like everybody's, oh, yeah, it's like five minutes away. 25 minutes later, you're still driving. You know what I mean? And so we were really blessed <laughs> at AKA because you could come in. And there was a boxing team, right? There were, the, like you said, the pro boxers, but then there were some of the amateurs like Jimmy, yeah. then Derek and, the, and Jerome and Jean-Claude with the Muay Thai guys and the Muay Thai team that developed there. And then obviously all the grapplers, the rest, first it was Eric Deuce that Frank brought Eric Deuce in and, and then Christian yeah. came in. Um, and then they started actively recruiting wrestlers. So you had all this wealth of knowledge from the individual disciplines that make up MMA all in one place one-stop shop where you didn't have to go yeah. anywhere and i still think a lot of people don't understand that like i have guys coming in they want to be fighters and i explain to them like if you want to be a basketball player because i was a basketball player that's my analogy you have to learn how to dribble you have to learn how to pass you have to learn how to shoot you have to learn how to re rebound and then when you put all that together then you can play the game and you'll start learning the nuances of the game mma the fundamentals of mma are jiu-jitsu wrestling boxing thai box muay thai right you have to, in my opinion, you if you're just trying to learn MMA as a whole, I don't think you'll be as successful, right? Because yeah. most of the best fighters, they all have one skill, at least at our gym, they all have one skill base that they've come in. They were a wrestler, they were a striker, they were a jiu-jitsu person. Javier forces everybody, okay, go put your gi on, take jiu-jitsu. Go put your gloves on and do the kickboxing class. You have to start learning the individual discipline separate from MMA, even though you're still doing <laughs> MMA, and I think that that really is one of the reasons that's part of the reasons, because some of the guys with their drive and talent, they were going to be successful any gym they went to. But I yeah. think that's one of the reasons we have so many fighters who have been successful in all of the different promotions. So, Bobby, when you look back, I'm going to go back to the ultimate fighter, because that it, when, whenever you look at it, that first season, you know, and I can tell you, you know, I'd been there for all the bad times and everything. You know, that that was a make or break. That was 
basically paid for by Lorenzo Fertitta to produce. It was paid for by Lorenzo Fertitta to put on Spike TV. You know, he was he was basically making a big gamble. He paid ten million dollars overall yep. for the entire thing. But you guys are, and it was because of your personalities, is the way I looked at it. You guys made it to where all of a sudden people looked at the sport like it wasn't a bunch of thugs, even though some guys were pissing on beds like Chris or <laughs> what you and or Josh were doing, putting hoses but, on people. Bingo! There you go. But <laughs> but it you they actually saw the the real side of you too. They saw the you know the you know look this is a tough guy, but he's got, he's got an emotional side too. And he, he, you know, he's got feelings and all this stuff. When you look back at that whole experience, what is, what is it that stands out to you the most? Well, nobody ever lets me forget the Chris Lieben thing. So that's always at the (laughs) forefront of my brain. But honestly, the thing that stands out to me the most was the, 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 do you want to be a fucking fighter speech? Right. Yeah. Then the weight cut. Right. The weight cut. And and then getting bad weight cut. Hey, man, I got I I keep telling the story, but I got to tell you, like that weight cut, like I have there's like almost 36 hours that I don't even have a coherent memory because I was sitting. I don't know. I don't know if you remember me and your wife and my my part still my wife, my partner. She was my partner back then. We're in riding in a limo or going somewhere after the whole tough finale and going, you know, doing something. But anyways, I'm still with her. We're sitting on the couch. Congratulations. That's great. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. um, um, and that second round with the load and fight starts and I comes out and he throws that kick and I check it and throw the three piece and drop him. And then I run in to, to do the finishing blow because he was kind of stiffed, but still sitting up a little bit. And then you ran in and stuck and tackled me all the way across the cage, the end of the wall of the I cage. I apologize. No, oh, no, that's okay. But I was, I looked at him. Oh, that's not what happened. I'm all, that's not ha- what happened. I hit him one time and he dropped. And then I started blowing kisses to you and the girls because that way, that's how bad that weight cut was is I had no coherent memory. And she's looking at me like, I'm crazy. She's like, what are you talking about? It's rewinded. It's fucking right there on the television. But that weight cut was so gnarly that I bad. had my memory of that time and like rehydrating and getting ready for the fight. If I moved wrong, I would cramp up and my and get pulled into this fetal position, and it looked like the alien was in my stomach because my mu- stomach muscles were cramping. And dude, like Forrest and another guy would open me up, pull me up just to get the cramps to relax. And that was still happening, man, when I was warming up before that fight. It was crazy. That was that's probably the biggest. Even though I have no like coherent like timeline of that whole time, it's all like comes in like a bad dream. But that's probably the thing that stands out, that and, and, and getting the finish in that fight. You know, that's that, yeah. those are probably the things that stand out the most. A lot of people don't remember that when that show went on, you fought multiple times. Diego fought multiple yeah. times. And there were guys that didn't fight at all <laughs> until one time. Yep. Because back then it wasn't you, you fought, you won, you sat to the side while everyone else had to fight. They could choose you to fight again. Yeah. And that was part of the, you know, the whole – there was all kinds of wacky stuff going on. But you guys – it was a learning I, I, experience, man. They didn't know what they were doing. Oh, I, they were just fucking oh, not at all. winging it. But it made, no. they chose, it made they chose you because they didn't think you could make the weight. Yeah. That's, as that, I recall, and I'm still, right? I'm still the whole, even to this day of the history of the show, I'm the only guy to ever make weight that ever had weight problems. All the other guys either didn't make the weight or they punked out and didn't make the cut. So well, Gabe Rudiger tried to go get a colonic. To uh, no, no, what, what, he didn't try to go get a colonic. <laughs> he did go he get did one. Go get a Jeez, man. And then he still missed weight. Damn, yeah, that's crazy. Jeez, man. Had his fucking anus ripped out. But it, was, missed weight. it was great. And I'm, I, you know, I'm super. You guys were talking earlier about like the fighters union, right? You, mm-hmm. you had mentioned something about that. And yeah. like, there's this whole, I'm not a part of that lawsuit. It's from an era of the UFC before me, but. My thing is you don't see me complaining, bitching mm-hmm. about the contract that I read and signed, right? And bitching and complaining about all that stuff. Same contract, right? Yep. And the UFC, like you said, they were $40 million in the hole plus Lorenzo's $10 million he put into the show. So one year after the Ultimate Fighter, they went from being $50 million in the hole to doing $279 million worth of revenue, right? It's kind of like right. those performance bonuses. Where's my cut? We're yeah. with interest. You know what I'm saying? But I'm not complaining. I mean, that was you you rolled the dice and 
going back to Fitch is another thing Fitch said to us one time after practice. He was talking to the whole team. He was like, hey, look, man, most of us aren't going to get rich off of this sport because this is before yeah. the explosion and before they were, you know, most of us are going to have to have a school or teach and coach and do things like that. So you guys might want to start thinking about that. And I mean, that had already that had already been my goal. I mean, that was my whole big thing was I just wanted to fight enough to get credentials to have a yeah. small martial arts academy and, 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 and live a decent life. And then it kind of all it all snowballed when I got that short notice call to fight um, Belfort and pride. And then mm -hmm. that kind of, you know, it kind of took on a life of its own. It was just you only you only had like five or six fights when you went to Pride and fought Pelfort. I think four, I, I think I had four. I think I was like three and four, one or yeah, four and okay. one at the time. Yeah, but you, yeah, yeah, you know, I mean, what are you gonna? Pride was the giant at that time, and it's like if yeah. they give you the call and you don't step up to the plate, they're not gonna call you again. Yeah. So that's how Pride worked. Yep. Yeah, and so it was just, dude, I was shitting a brick. What do you think I was thinking? <laughs> <laughs> I was like vomiting. I was, as you could even ask Hob, I, Hob and Crazy You're Bob. Pulling was, a Paul Botticello. Totally. But Paul did that every fight. I was just doing he that did. fight. You know what I mean? Cause it was like, <laughs> that was, that was probably one of the best experiences of my whole career because you've, you've fought in Japan as well, Josh. Yeah. And I'm sure you've been there. The, the treatment that you get over there, signing autographs, the way the fans treat you. And then we go into the super, arena or whatever and there's 50,000 people in there and they're taking you in a golf cart because it's a quarter of a mile or half a mile to get to the fucking run you know what I mean it was just yeah yep. it was it was insane but I was in the back thinking I'm like yeah how you feeling I'm like yeah I'm just puking in the buckets it was that was crazy Vitor Belford has that effect on people man right yeah. Right. You know, especially being young in your career, like you said, three and one or four and one at the time, and just being like, "Man, I'm fi I'm literally fighting Vitor Belfort. This is fucking crazy." And th this, this is he insane. was still a wrecker then. This was before he yeah. had his like little slump that he had in his career, and so he was still. Yeah, I was. Oh, uh, he look. He was fat. He had fast hands. Yeah. He had good stand up. He had his ground was good. Yeah, you know, it was, it was, wasn't wasn't his strength, but man, he, the guy could fight. Yeah, yeah, for sure, <laughs> no doubt. Not to mention he was a. Uh, <laughs> just a little enhanced. bit enhanced he was enhanced, enhanced. just okay. a little bit which i think has been proven so we could talk about it we <laughs> could talk about that i can been, been verified i have stories um <laughs> i'm sure um you know when you look back at your career i mean are you overall happy with it and if there is there any part of your career you're like that was my peak moment and then this was also my kind of my my not my downfall but like my low moment and where i was contemplating whether i wanted to keep doing it or not I had a couple of low moments in my career, but if I was, I mean, I'm, I'm overall happy with my career as a guy who, like I said, it, I, I never, I didn't even, it was something that came after I started being doing martial arts. I was just a martial artist and then fighting became something that I did. Right. And if I look back at my career, I wish I had taken more of the fights, you know, after I fought in pride and after I did, the ultimate fighter, I kind of had a bit of a chip on my shoulder, you know, and it was a different time back then. You know, I, I, I had guys calling me up after, after tough offering me to fight the main event of their show and offering me 1200 bucks. Yeah. You know what I mean? That, that was, that's insulting. You know what I mean? And so, but at the same time, taking that fight could have led to bigger paydays, right. And greater, greater cage experience and things like that. And, so that's one of my regrets is, I mean, I only have like maybe 20 fights. Um, if I had to take you, you had a moment, you had a moment though, right? Where you were, you were there to fight somebody, the fight fell through or whatever. And then they wanted you to fight Quentin Jackson, like on a short notice thing. Correct. Was that King of the cage? No, I, that was King of the cage. And I think uh -huh. I, they wanted me to fight Quentin Jackson, but he came in and the dude weighed in at two nineteen. Right. He weighed in at 219 pounds and I had already made weight. I had already mm -hmm. made the weight. And so they were trying to get me to fight Quentin and Terry Treblecock wasn't even offering me any more money. Mm -hmm. What he was going to do that, was. Hold it. Yeah. Hold it. That, that would be Terry. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love Terry. But um, and then. And so everybody made it seem like I should have just taken the fight. And yes, I should have taken the fight because that's what made Quentin's career. Me not taking mm -hmm. that fight was when they went into the stands and literally pulled this, the duty fought was smoking a cigarette. He had just come from the bar. Cause I was, 
I was standing in the back talking to him and he has smoking a cigarette with the drink in his hand. They went in, out and asked anybody if they, they would fight because I would refuse to fight because they weren't giving me any more money. And they brought this dude in and there were all these Japanese people there. That was where Sean Shirk made his debut and got seen. Not his debut, but he got seen by the Japanese people and that I think he went and fought one fight in Japan and then became a, U a UFC monster. Um, but that's what got Quinton into pride. Yeah, he, got he, got a, he got a fight against Sakuraba right after that. Yep, yep. Yeah. And so, you know, that's that That would probably be my biggest regret is not fight taking the fight with Quinton. Yeah. You know what I mean? And You, know, you, you had a fight in Strike Force, and I, I repped it, and it was against Hanato Babalu. Yes, and it was uh you were doing it was it was only I think it was only one round. I was winning. But it was oh dude, was you were you were you were putting it on him. And you got hit right near the end of the round and it straight straight up and down cut nasty. And uh you had to look at that fight and go, What is it? Because you, I mean Hanato had fought Fedor, he had fought everyone, and he was good at that moment. Yeah. That was his peak. And like I said, you were putting it on him. I so the one thing I remember out of that fight is like, that's just horrible because he was just smoking him in that fight. Because I dropped him yeah. too after the cut. Oh, I yeah. dropped him at the end of the round, and they were going to let it go. And then I, all I wanted him to, them to do was just let me come out. Well, give me one minute of the second round, you know. But yep. maybe that's karma, you know, for putting the wa the water hose or calling Chris Lieben a bad name or what. I mean, it is. It is. <laughs> what do you, you do? You you need to get over the whole Chris. Right. Chris has had a hell of a career. And now he's an official. He's doing great. Yeah. Speaking of that, how do I get in on your course? How do can, how do I become an official, brother? All you got to do is, uh, you know what? After this, I will. Uh, I'll get your information, and when I'll I have it. when I have a a course, I will send you the information, and you are more than welcome. Oh, awesome! That would be awesome. I know it's a long road, but I, it's something I've always been it interested is. in, and is being an official. So you know, the one part of the, it's also good if if you have guys that you know are fighting stuff. It helps you as a trainer to understand what they can do, when they can do it. Are they winning the fight? Are they not? It'll help you there too. So yes. it's a, it's, a, it's just good for you. I follow you on Instagram too. You you have some pretty good takes on how the judging should have went. Maybe you should be a judge too because we need that these days. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I stopped hey. I stopped putting up the the stuff with the UFC clips and my commentating and stuff like that because they kept flagging me and taking uh, my and, oh, yeah. and, and blocking my videos, and so I never I. Other people yeah. are doing it, but they're not getting flagged. Yeah. So I'm not sure what I'm doing wrong. I'm not social media. Yeah, you can take a still shot. You can take a still shot and swipe it in and swipe it out. But if you use any type of the video content or the sound of it at all, they'll flag you every single time. Uh, you There's can put all the still shots you want. Okay. There was a moment, though, Bobby, in your career, and I was there. We were down in uh, Palm Desert, and it was at the Ultimate Athlete. You were literally standing oh, on the oh, walk yeah. down, bouncing up and down, getting ready to do the walkout. And the and brawl started. <laughs> and all of a sudden, you had the Mongols and the Hells Angels that decided to get into it. Yeah, some guy got uh, stabbed, right? Didn't yeah, get stabbed? Guys, yeah, one or two guys got stabbed. So yeah, just you were literally on the stage. It was big walk down into the into the yeah. ring. It was a ring. Um, some of our other guys had fought earlier in the night, but you were like the, the you were like the co-main event or something. I just remember standing there getting ready to walk down with you and all of a sudden the brawl breaks out. What the fuck was going through your mind as you're watching all this shit? I was just like, <laughs> what? I mean, yeah. it was just fucking insane. And then we're fucking going back. They made us get off the stage. Remember, we're walking back to the room and all of a sudden the door kicks in, right? And some guy comes through pointing an M16 right at me. Yeah. And I'm like, ah, I jump behind Bob. We're going to shoot the black guy. <laughs> i literally said that oh, it was crazy geez. man that, that the helicopters flying around they had the national guard i think they call a national guard contingent that came out yeah to subdue the situation it was that was so insane it was crazy man but i just remember us being there and everyone going that was nuts and then we never we never heard from that promotion again they had a magazine out they had a they were throwing fights no, were, yeah it was us. blown up to be something big yeah it seemed like it was and then we never heard from them ever again after that. Maybe that that that, that was because that the the one the guy who fought in the fight before it was a Mongol. Yeah, he was mm -hmm. part of their club. Something Slayton, right? Yeah, I remember I that. Think, yep, Rick Slayton. Rick Slayton. It was Rick Slayton. Rick Slayton. That's Slayton. it. Yep. Boom. That's it. And he lost he the fight, and their guys got pissed off. 
And that's that kind of what started exactly the role or something like that. I, yeah. yeah. And I was going to, I remember I was going to fight Brian Foster because he was, he was a tough dude. That was going to be a tough yeah. fight, man. He was standing right behind me. Yeah. And you guys were like, man, I mean, did you guys get, did you guys ever get paid for that fight? I wanted all my money. They only paid me the show money though. I was like, man, that's okay. not our fault that you guys, your security, I, but they didn't want to pay me. So yeah. Yeah. I, they I, went out of business I, after that. So, yeah. um, you know, I guess I guess where you're at now though, you know, you moved to San Antonio. Shit, you beat the you beat the rush, man. You got out here way before I did. Yeah, right. You know, so you guys I'm sure you guys <laughs> locked down your house and your everything around there for a pretty great uh rate and price and everything. But you've been out here for what now? A little over twelve, twelve. I've been years? I can't no, fourteen. We came in two thousand ten. Yeah, man. Okay. March first, two thousand ten. <clears throat> I remember and uh I saw you I saw you, you know, coaching some guys, you know, in your garage for a while. It looked like in your garage or someone's garage. Yep. And then now you have your own place. And yep. uh how's it going, man? Hey everyone, the Weighing In Podcast was the very first podcast that ever had a relationship with OF. And our relationship was in trying to bring bring combat athletes and fans together. It has been working. We've got a ton of people who are on OF now, fighters that you can go, you can sign up with. You can ask them questions. You can look for techniques that they use. It is a fantastic system. If you are that person that wants that one-on-one -on -one interaction, OF is the easiest way for you to do it. Yeah, you guys, check out OnlyFans. Subscribe to us over there. It is free. We have continued our partnership with them, and we're going to be there for at least a couple more years. Well, that's the hopes. Ooh, yeah. And look, we're enjoying working with them. They are a great company in terms of also bringing other athletes on. They're working close with Formula One. They're working close with a lot of combat sports athletes. They just signed Billy Kemper. Billy Kemper is now on their platform. Also, giving awesome surfer. Surfy, amazing surfer. Giving extra information. If both of you guys don't know the background on OnlyFans, OnlyFans was originally started for, for sports, for yeah. soccer players, the European soccer market, having coaches being able to sell their information to their closest fans or people that really were driven to try to be the best. This is what it was produced for. That's what we're going to be trying to do. We're providing extra content over on OnlyFans. Make sure you guys subscribe to us over there. It is free. There will be some stuff that we charge for, but right now our pro our page and all the content we put on there is free. So subscribe to us over there at OnlyFans. It's coming along, man. I gotta tell you, it's rough because I'm, I'm I ain't no businessman. You know what I mean? I, I always <laughs> wanted to teach, and I, I feel like I'm a pretty good coach. But going yeah. back to regretting things, like I wish I had paid more attention when me and Alex opened the AKA, the second AKA in Sunnyvale, and got a little bit more on the back office type of stuff. But you know the gym. It's not well into the black, but it's it's the pro financial projection was two years to get it profitable. Mm -hmm. We're a year and a half in. It's in the black. It's you know it's making a little bit of money, so I'm not complaining. And I'm just kind. Of, I want. I don't want to say I'm enjoying the process because really I want to. I want to focus on my teaching. You know what I mean? And yeah, and I, I'm not trying to have a gladiator facility. You know, like like no. most gyms, you're not going to make money off fighters and even. Unless you get a full UFC champion, I I want the hobbyists, the people that just want a fun way to get in shape and learn self defense. Maybe some guys want to compete. I do have a few fighters. Um, I got a couple guys. There's this thing here in Texas called the Muay Thai Development League. Mm -hmm. Um, they want to be kickboxers, and so one guy's getting ready to do his third. One guy's ready to, getting ready to do his second. Another guy's getting ready to do his first. And then I have another kid who's got a, an amateur MMA fight but he's got a really good job. Like he's a civil engineer. He wants mm. to be a fighter, a pro fighter and stuff like that. But like you yeah. it, it, see, it's, it's, I try to explain to these guys, it's, it's a full-time job in and of itself. It you know, it's you coming to classes, you know, if it's, you're not a hundred percent in, yeah, yeah. Don't, it's, don't do I, I explain to them it's business. an eight hour, eight hour minimum, eight hour a day job. Even when you don't have a fight, 10 hours yeah. a day, it's like you're up in the morning, strength training and cardio. You're going in, you're training your jujitsu. Right. Mm -hmm. Then that's even before noon training. Then you have two hours. So you're already three hours in three and a half or yeah. half hours in before pro. Then you're going in at night to do more skills work, bike workouts. I mean, that's what it takes if you really want to be successful. Yeah. You know, it's, so, it's a, it's a process. It's definitely a process. Yeah. You know, uh, the business side of it was like for me, when I was opening my gyms, it was just making sure that the EFTs were running through. So I don't know if you have an EFT program, making sure that those are running through, yep. you know, and you're getting your payment every month and making sure that that's, and, and all the credit cards, 
that are actually uh they're not outdated they're not expired yep. you know or they didn't cancel it something along those lines because the last thing you want to do is run up to a member and go hey man you you didn't run you know your credit card didn't go through the last three months now you owe me for three months plus this month yeah. they're like yeah i might as well just quit you exactly. know i'm done i don't have that money and you run and you, you run know? into that a lot which is why there's this like if they don't they get like one month if they don't pay mm -hmm. they can't even log into the system and yeah. and and come to the gym to train and, and you don't want to and i don't want to be that guy you don't want to you know, be that i don't want to be it's not like good it's, i don't want to be like paulie and goodfellas right like fuck you pay me you know what i mean it's like <laughs> that's not the yeah, way to build do, a Bob. culture of, that's not the way to build a, well yeah i want to get it's paid hard. but that's not yeah. a good way to build the culture of the gym you know and it's hard we have a we have a real good vibe here um honestly it's the marketing part like we built we built it up from the garage to where we're at now, like maybe 60 members with no marketing at all. It's all just been word mm -hmm. of mouth, grassroots, people seeing the spot coming in, trying classes. Um, and do you guys have a kids program? We do. We just started the kids program maybe five or six months ago. Yeah, that's the that's, biggest thing. Man. That's the one. That's what you I, put your all your time and effort into. Yeah, I try to get rid of my adults. I try not to work with them at all because they're lazy. I want to work <laughs> with the kids. The kid, the kids are they're not only are they just a, you can see the growth in them, and I love seeing when kids they look over at your coach to see if you're paying attention because they, they just hit yeah. the move that you. Yeah, they do them that. that they do that in the middle of when they're competing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but they they really want they really want coach's approval on what what you just taught them. Do you see? I did it. I did it. Like. Yep. Adults are like, oh yeah, yeah, you know, maybe maybe they'll try the technique, maybe they won't. They're kind of those. It's hard for me to really get motivated to coach adults. Yeah, you know, women's kids, classes man, and kids. I'm telling you, I that's, try, that's one of my goals. Is we have like only two women that train here, and they're a little mm -hmm. sporadic in their training. So I'm definitely this. It's just the sign of a healthy gym culture. I mean, and I get yep. it for women. Jujitsu is an awkward. Yeah, it's an awkward thing to come in with a bunch of dudes and. You know, you're learning from the yeah. bottom guard position. You know what I mean? And so the, the more the more kids you have, though, the more moms will come in. You know, and what I would do is I would actually run a, I, for my gym. I ran two different programs. I ran the kids jujitsu class one. at one time. I ran the fitness program at, at the same time on the other side, or the women's jujitsu program at the same time. And then on Saturday mornings, I ran a parent and me. So the kid would actually teach the mom the technique that they learned that week. They would teach oh, nice. the mom, and the mom and the kid would roll together on Saturday. Oh, I didn't mornings. do that. That, it was awesome, man. That that was probably one. one of my biggest classes because the young boys always wanted to teach the mom or the young girls wanted to teach the mom. Or, you know, if the dad came in, there was nothing better than watching the son try to explain to his dad something his dad didn't understand. And just seeing the kid go, hey, dad, look at this. I can do this. And he's like, oh, you can do it like this. It was just, it was very, it was very eye opening, you know, just to see this son be like, oh, you don't know this? You don't know, you know, and yeah. so and the, and the dad's like, no, man, you're here to show me. Teach That's me. a good idea because I was going to have a family jujitsu, which was more like phenomenal idea where they come in and they're learning together. But I think mm. that puts a lot of, of onus on both parties, right? Yeah. Now the kid has something. Oh, if I learn this, I'm going to be able to show my dad, right? And then the dad's more like, well, if I don't learn this, my kid's going to yeah. show me up my on Saturday. Show me, right? be doing it on That's me. That's a good <laughs> idea, man. I'm going to I'm gonna have to implement that. It's a great time. Even and also too, what I did was I offered it to the parents. I said, Hey, even if you're not a member, I still need you to come in and be there so they can teach you the move that they learned that week. Cause then what they got to do is they got to buy a gi from you. Mm. So if you want to be part of this, so your kid can come in and for a parent and me, they buy a gi from you and they buy a belt from you with, you know, a white belt or whatever. And then, then you have your, your son is able, or your daughter is able to teach your, teach your parent that the move that weekend, you don't have to be a member. That's, I don't need you to pay for your hour of class. You're, I'm just doing this for the parent. And then all of a sudden the parent starts to get involved because the son's more involved or the daughter's more involved. And Josh is that guy that pulls the white belt out of the package of the gi and then yeah. sells it to you separately. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, gi companies now, man, they don't sell them together anymore. Uh, they don't sell them together anymore. I wish they did. Uh, uh, but then again, I own the gi company, so it makes it easier. Nice. There you go. <laughs> uh, but yeah. outside of that, though, man, looks like everything's doing well. I love, I love seeing your stuff. I'll have to come down and uh, offer up a free seminar for your guys. Come down. It doesn't have to be yeah. free, man. Might as well I make it be free. Might as well oh, make come on, buck. brother. We go. Well, we go. I'll too charge. Far back. Then I'll keep all the you. money. <laughs> there you go. That's a Bobby that's, thing. That's right my there. that's my pulling the white belt out of the package. 
That's your one. That's your. <laughs> hey, dude, that's my one percent. I've owed you one zero there go. zero zero one percent. There goes the interest from the bonuses. <laughs> no, for sure. Nice. At, oh, at least call, at least covers the interest. Bobby, my my last question for you is, like you you are a pioneer in this sport from the you know being there at the beginning nineteen ninety nine I believe is when I first saw you. When you look at the sport now, what's your feelings about it? Where do you think it's headed, and what should change? if you think there should be something. I like this. I, I love the sport. I mean, I watch, I watch every, the UFCs on Saturdays. I watch one. Those are the ones I watch the most because they're the easiest and they don't usually conflict. One of the things that I love is remember back in the day when we, when we, it, we guys were just fighting out of the gym, but then we made the AK 18. Right. Yeah. But already there was Brazilian top team. There was shoot box. There were some prominent, Militich fighting, there were some prominent MMA teams, but you pretty much, it was very rare for fighters to come in and be competing at the highest level with those top teams, right? There's so much more parity in the sport, right? You're seeing these dudes, these these kids come into the UFC and you've never even heard of them. Maybe you just saw them on the contenders, but they've got, Jesus, man, it's crazy, man. As you see these kids are 20 years old, 22 years old. They've got 15 fights already. You know what I mean? But there's so much more parity, right? So that means the expansion of the sport, the coaching is better across the board, not just for MMA, but for boxing, Thai boxing, for all the components of the sport. So that means martial arts in general, combat sports in general are growing, and I think that's a great thing. You know, there's a lot more spectacle involved with it. And being more of a martial artist, that's not really my thing, but you got to sell, right? And so it's, it's kind of like, it's like taxes, you know what I mean? It's like, you have to pay your, it's, it's a part, it's just a part of what's going on with the sport. And you, you have to accept it. If you, if you love the sport in general, you have to, you have to accept some of the things that are going on. Would I like to see a little bit a little bit less of the pro wrestling stick because you know everybody's trying to be a Kale Son and everybody's trying to be a Conor McGregor, and it looks cheesy. I mean, that's just yeah. you, you and you and it. It's just not my. I mean, I know I had a big mouth and I did all those things on the show, but for the most part, I don't. I don't think that I've done a whole lot of mouth running in regards to when I'm in the cage and fighting and around the fight. But that's what's selling fights, and 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 they need to sell. So yeah. The mouth that we heard from you is that was really you though. Like for yes. Chael, that's a shtick. <laughs> that's like, a that's stick. A <laughs> for him. You know, like Conor McGregor, there's a shtick part of him, but he is a little mouthy. But that's that's he's also do, running a shtick as well a little yeah. bit. You know, certain guys have that. And uh, but I guess look, I want to go back over the just this will be my last one as well. But pay per view this last weekend, Alex Pajeda, phenomenal, phenomenal fighter. I mean, what's your thoughts on him? And then you know you have guys that like you said are kind of it that have this aura about him, like all the entertainment value, Sugar Sean O'Malley. You know, what's your take on him? These these two guys uh, are two of the biggest stars in the sport right now. You've got Islam, who's a, just a different breed, you know, in terms of comes from the AKA background. Fa he's basically family to us. Doesn't you know, talk. But <laughs> doesn't, you know, but he's got a great personality when he does talk, yeah. you know? Like, we all joked around with him and had, funny. like, this phenomenal, phenomenal person inside. But my bottom line is, those two guys with Alex Pajeda and Sean O'Malley, they bring different type of eyeballs to the to the sport. One being, like you said, more your style. Didn't like to talk a whole lot. Very composed. Goes out there and wants to let his fighting do his talking. Sean O'Malley fights like a dog, man. He's got a lot in him. Yeah. Uh, but he's also, you know, very, uh, I don't want to say. Showy. Flat, showy. He's yeah, showy. I was going to say flamboyant, but not, that's not the right word, but showy. Yeah. You know, what's your take on these two guys? I think it's kind of shows the two dynamics of the sport, right? Where you have guys that are trying to come up in the sport and they're, they're trying to be an O'Malley or a McGregor and some other guys, they're the more, the more stoic warrior type like Pajeda. Um, I wasn't an O'Malley fan in the beginning, right? But he can fight. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. you, you can't deny that. Although no. I don't think that he's well-rounded enough You saw what it, I mean, we were all just waiting for him to go against a good wrestler, right? That's, yeah. we were waiting for him to go against a good wrestler with cardio. And we saw what Marab did taking him down. Um, Pajeda is an example of kind of what I was talking about of a fighter who he has his, he's a, he's a striker, 
right? But he's come in and he's worked on the different fundamental aspects of MM, MMA, his, his wrestling, his anti-grappling, all of those things. And he's having major success. Um, I'm a big fan of his. I was surprised. You know, I, I, I think Khalil Roundtree probably doesn't realize that he, he, he lost the fight, but he, he made some fans. Because he was putting it on. He won for the first two rounds. He, yeah, I was going to say he won the first two won rounds. the first two rounds. And then he started, he, to, the first two he started to get tired. And that was going to be my big question for him was what's going to happen when you get halfway through the third round, right? When you're at the halfway point of the fight because he's only fought three round fights. You know what I mean? And he and he's a he's an explosive fighter, which doesn't really play into the endurance part of, yeah. of the strategy, right? Um, I think we're going to see continue to see in the sport fighters like that like on both ends of the spectrum and then everybody else will be in between i'm a, i'm an o'malley fan i'm, I'm not a fan of this the show stuff but i think he's a good fighter he does have a dog in him and he's got really good stand-up um and perhead i think they're gonna we'll we'll find out when he fights uncle Laev. that's that's yeah. really where we're gonna find out because that's gonna be somebody i'm not gonna say you could match who can match his striking ability, but he could match his physical ability and then is going to have an upper hand in not just on the ground, but in the aspects of the fight that will get the fight to the ground, closing the Very distance, true. getting the clinch, wearing on Pajeda, maybe getting him tired out and getting and, and sapping his striking ability. Mm -hmm. And as Pajeda loses that, the KO power, the kicks, the movement, that might play more into Ankalaev's strategy. So we're, we'll see, you know, but I'm a fan of both fighters and, it's just interesting to see what's going to happen with the sport, you know. Last one. Who, who's your Who's your favorite fighter right now, and why? <clears throat> I mean, my my favorite fighter isn't active anymore, but um, <laughs> well, who was that then? GSP was probably one of my favorite yeah. fighters. Um, but you know who I really like watching fight is I like watching Marab. I really like watching Marab fight just because he's like a little energizer bunny. You know yeah. what I mean? It's just like, it's like watching the Tasmanian devil in real life. You know what I mean? Just never <laughs> he stops. It's like he just never Gross. stops. Moving. Ah, it's all crazy. Yeah. And I was happy to see him get that win. I, 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 my only worry for him was that O'Malley might catch him coming in, you know, mm -hmm. catch him with maybe on, right on the edge of a right or catch him with a nice uppercut and sit him down. So I really like watching him fight. And then my second, I like, I mean, I like a lot of fighters, man. It's yeah. There's too many to name, but GSP yeah. would pre be one of my all-time favorites. Um, DC is up there too because of what he did in both weight classes and being. I mean, he wasn't even a big light heavyweight to do what he did at heavyweight. You know what I mean? His his. Well, he's a big light heavyweight now, though. Well, yeah. yeah, he's a big <laughs> he's a big heavyweight right now. He's a big heavyweight. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He, he should he should have been an 85 pounder if we're being real. Yeah. He was he in wrestling. Been. Yeah, he was yeah. an 89er in rest. Yeah, he should have been an 85 pounder. I mean, let's Go be back honest. To he, just didn't, he liked to eat. He liked to eat. He liked. Uh, he didn't want. Can't blame him for that. He didn't like to cut weight. You know. His I'm also deal, a big so. fan of Dustin Poirier. I, I was. Oh my god. Yeah, and I'm was bummed that he he couldn't realize you know the the, the world title. Um, and I'm not sure. I'm hopefully he's still. Get, I'm not sure how the UFC works the Hall of Fame. If you have to be a world champion to get into the no, Hall of Fame, no, because he's definitely no. worthy of being. A, being he'll being get in, in the Hall for of fame. sure for one of his fights because they induct fights for so for sure True. he'll get in for at least one or two or three or four of his many of fights yeah. that he'll probably will get in for. No, look at Cowboy Cerrone. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, there you go, there you oh. go. Hey, Bobby, Dustin, man, Dustin will definitely be there. I want to thank you so much, man, for coming on. Uh, give me a shout or give us a shout out for your American Kickboxing Academy in San Antonio. How do we find you? Where you know Instagrams, all that stuff. Yeah, if you're looking to train martial arts in San Antonio, check us out. AKA San Antonio .com is the website. You can find us on Facebook at AKA Texas, on Instagram at AKA San Antonio. Um, we got kids, adults, men, women, children, um, boxing, kickboxing. Jiu Jitsu Gi and No Gi, come check us out. Um, we're family friendly. You won't be disappointed. Yeah, my man, my man, my man. Bobby. Hey, brother, man, thank you so much. No, you guys, Sean. thanks for having me. It's an honor and a privilege. Really appreciate you guys including me. Bobby, it's always a, always special to talk to you, man. You're always a class class athlete. Loved everything you've done in your career. And congratulations on the school. Thank I hope you. it just explodes. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. The legendary Bobby Southworth.